tell some of that story in, in the Red Book, um, and um, which is the second book that we wrote on dual language. Um, dual language education for a transformed world, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> that was the title. I like the plug. <laughs> and um, uh, my my growing up was part of my childhood in Centro America, and so I grew up bilingually. My dad was a, a professor of Central American history, and uh, we lived down there for five years, off and on, driving down. Uh, in the 1950s, when it was uh, there weren't many roads, <laughs> we traveled every road that was there, and um, so I grew up bilingually. Um, when my two daughters, we moved to D.C., Washington, D.C., um, I uh, hadn't thought about raising them bilingually, and the first bilingual school got developed right in our neighborhood, um, John Eaton School, um, along with Oyster. Uh, 1970, my daughter was a first grader there and invited to be a member of the, of the bilingual classes, and she said, yeah, why not? And then afterwards said, Mom, why didn't you raise me in Spanish? Um, <laughs> And so anyway, um, that first year was, I couldn't stay out of the classroom. It was so exciting. The um, Eliana Roman from Chile and Sherry Schumabam from California, both fabulous bilingual teachers, um, teaching a class of, of African American students, Latinos and, and Anglos and, and Jewish kids. And, uh, it was there was so much richness in what was happening in that school, and I said, "This is it. This is this is the school that I want for all children in the United States." Encontró su pasión. You found your passion. And uh, then when he met me after we had both finished our PhDs and came to George Mason University and said, "This woman must be crazy." <laughs> And gorgeous, right? Well, Crazy the, and gorgeous. My actual words were something along the lines of, she's really intriguing, but maybe a few bricks short of a full load when it comes to this bilingual business. <laughs> and um, I was coming from the perspective of having been raised in Central Virginia, very monolingual Central Virginia. Now, my ancestors have been in Virginia for 300 years, so mostly Scots and Irish immigrants, and they long since have lost their Gaelic, Gaelic, and other languages that they originally spoke. So I had no experience with multilingualism, uh, other than I had studied other languages starting in grade eight in high school and college, like many people do. Um, so when I met Ginger, she was a completely different type of person with a completely different background than the one I was used to. And so I was indeed intrigued, not only with her, but with what she was saying, because she was saying that based on her experience, these children who are in bilingual programs would greatly outscore and, and outachieve students who were in monolingual programs, most especially if these students were English learners. Now, I had a long background as a Title I specialist. I had been a, a high school teacher, trained to be a high school principal, uh, was drafted to the central office in Loudoun County, Virginia, as a uh, planning and evaluating type of person in the central office. So I had education experience, and uh, but most I had evaluated Title I programs and to some extent special needs programs. So when I first heard from her about this population of students called English learners, frankly I, I guess I was aware that they existed but I had no prior experience with them. And so I was more than a bit interested in that I did have, and still have, of course, a passion for social justice, but it had just never been directed at English learners before. Uh, but she introduced me to that population, and after looking at the numbers, after all, I am a program evaluation and research specialist, I realized that, one, this is the largest group at-risk group in U.S. schools. Two, it's the most in need. Three, it's the least funded by federal and state agencies. And it's also for the fastest growing group. And so the short version is I shifted my focus from Title I to English learners in perhaps the anticipated hope of becoming a bit more, uh, a bit closer to her professionally as well as personally, I'll admit it. There you go, see? I, I'm sure that you had already heard this before. It was it was dual language and emergent bilinguals that brought the two of you together. Otra, otra vez, otra vez, eh? para que no digan. Perfect. Um, so I want you, I want to give you a scenario. I want you to think that um, there's a principal out there of, of, about to implement a new dual language program. And um, he or she only 
only has um, the opportunity to read one of your books, which one would you recommend that that new principal, that new dual language principal read? I mean, obviously all of them are great, but if, if, if a practitioner only has time for one, I'm gonna make you choose. It's it's the Sophie's Choice question you've been dreading your whole, whole, your whole lives. It's an easy choice. Ah, okay, easy good. <laughs> Why dual language school? And the reason is, that is the overview, comprehensive look. Some would say it's the book we should have written first. It's actually number four in the sequence, but it gives the overview of the content covered in books one, two, and three, uh, plus some other stuff, and it's also shorter than some of the other books. It was inspired by one of our good friends who's a superintendent in, uh, in Oregon, uh, and so he said, Wayne, Ginger, we need a short version so I can use it with parents and other interested parties, school board members who have questions about this mysterious concept called dual language. And would you please consider writing such a document for me? And he didn't have in mind a book size document. <laughs> you know, I, as a former school administrator myself, I understood that from the beginning. And so uh, we wrote a, what, 20 page version or so? And then we realized after we had written it that, Chuck, this is something that we really need to take and expand. In fact, we it's really tough to write a 20 page version of this. We need to at least double it to 40 or 50 pages anyway. And that's really the beginning of it. Yeah, yeah, we wanted a short version of, you know, this is why you need to do dual language in all schools in the U.S. This is the bottom line. And this is the overview. We were writing it for school board members, for families, bilingual families, policymakers, superintendents. Nice. And so can you look, one of the two, one of you, can you look into the camera and remind us what the title, the full title of that book is? Why do dual language, language schooling. schooling. <laughs> I'm, happy, I'm happy to know the plugging here, the plugging. <laughs> Right? It's a yellow cover. It's the yellow book. Yes. It's the yellow Thomas and Collier book. And it's written not for research specialists, not for university professors. It's written for parents, school board members, and anyone who's interested in why dual language schooling? Why is it a good idea? Why is it something everyone should be doing? Yeah, well, I think it's a great transition to my next question. So um, I had a pretty uh, traumatic entry into the U.S. public school system. My parents are from Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico, and so I'm the firstborn. Um, and I know that that fuels my personal passion um, and why I advocate so much for dual language. Um, there's a lot of conversation at this point in time, specifically in the United States, about serving the needs of student populations that really have been marginalized um, and oppressed by U.S. school systems um, forever and ever, um, specifically language learners, students with special education needs, um, students of color.